This is Professor David Bishai, and this is the introductory lecture to our course on health economics. The title of this lecture is Health and Health Systems. The outline for today is to cover the multiple perspectives that people view the health economy through. We're going to cover basic definitions of terms like health and health systems, and we're going to define what we mean by the word health system, showing that there are multiple pieces that have to fit together in order for us to understand the functioning of the health system. And then we're going to begin to think about how to apply these terms to our work as health economists. So let's start with important distinctions. First, I'd like to distinguish between health and health care. Health refers to a state of the human body and mind. It is how the human tissue and mental state is functioning. Now health care refers to the chemicals, devices, and services used by people to improve their health. And the term medicine, as in modern medicine, is used to refer to just the services that are part of health care. Health insurance will take up a lot of our attention this course, and health insurance is a system of paying for unpredictable needs to pay for health care. When we talk about health, Health economists have traditionally identified three distinguishing features of health. Uncertainty, asymmetric information, and externalities. And because of these three features, we believe that government intervention may be warranted. Let's cover why these three features motivate government intervention. First, let's define uncertainty. Many things in health and medicine are uncertain, both to the doctors and to the patients. Take a look at these three skin lesions. Which of them would you look at and say, that's got to be cancer? Well, both doctors and patients would have some reason to be unsure. Since I know the answer, I'll tell you that the lesion on the far left with the red center is melanoma, and that is definitely cancer. The lesion in the middle is a basal cell carcinoma, which is unlikely to be lethal, but can certainly be a lot of trouble. And the lesion on the far right is not cancer, that's just a seborrheic keratosis. But doctors would have to take a biopsy to resolve the uncertainty. So both doctors and patients don't know what the condition is and exactly how to treat it with 100% certainty. So patients don't know if and when they will be sick and they don't know the early signs of sickness, and providers don't know the diagnosis with 100% certainty, and they don't know if the treatment will work. So they're treating patients under uncertainty, selling a product that might help, might hurt, might kill, uh, all with probability. The second point is asymmetric knowledge. Providers usually know more about the services than the patient, except in this cartoon where the doctor doesn't know as much about the patient. And asymmetric knowledge can actually go both ways. There are parts of the health economy where the patient has superior knowledge about what's going on inside their body and might use that to their advantage when they purchase health insurance. So there are adaptations to asymmetric knowledge. Patients who can't tell for sure whether a doctor is of high quality would proxy the true technical quality by making observations about how clean the facilities are, how long they have to wait, how many diplomas are on the wall. Patients will use reputation and word of mouth. They will want to repeatedly interact with the healthcare provider. And increasingly today, patients become informed by going to WebMD or other internet resources to look up their medical symptoms prior to going to seek medical care. Uh, on the other side, medical schools will also try to adapt to asymmetric knowledge when they are choosing medical school applicants. They will look through the references and MCAT scores to try to tell which candidates are worth offering a medical degree to. And then they'll have to socialize them in codes of ethics to try to make up for any limitations that the medical student has in their willingness to practice good medicine. Finally, externalities. An economic externality is when a person or group external to a transaction derives benefit or harm from the transaction. So we think of transactions as usually involving two people who are getting benefit, 
with an externality there is a third, fourth, fifth, or millionth person who is looking at that transaction and deriving benefit or harm. The classic example would be pollution, where I make a deal with your neighbor to dump garbage in your neighbor's backyard for $100 a ton. Your neighbor's happy, I'm happy, I got rid of my garbage, but you're the external person and you're not happy. You derived harm from my transaction with your neighbor. There could be a beneficial externality when my neighbor decides to buy bees and sells the honey to you, and I'm very happy because I'm the farmer next door and I get free pollination services. So externalities exist in the realm of medicine. An externality in health is obviously contagious disease. If 80% of the students in a dormitory have been vaccinated against meningococcal meningitis, then Mary, who's not vaccinated, will also derive benefit. On the downside, there are TB patients who may stop taking their medication, and this would be uh, of low benefit or actually harmful to somebody who would catch TB. A different type of externality is also worth talking about. Rather than actually getting sick from someone's contagious disease, human beings have the capacity for altruism and caring about others. So when we see somebody else who's suffering, it can give us usually harm. Take a look at this picture of a child with a disease called cancrum oris, where flies have laid eggs and larvae have grown inside her cheek, destroying her face. When we see this person, we are both disturbed and harmed uh, as altruistic individuals, and this is an altruistic externality. We want to do something about this individual suffering. Another picture of suffering is what we do in economics, where we represent suffering statistically through maps or graphical charts. Each dot on this map represents 5,000 child deaths. So it's insidious where you can look at these little red dots, but imagine multiplying each dot times 5,000 children dying, and one also can participate in altruistic externalities from wanting to do something about statistical suffering. Now, one tangential point is that I probably got a bigger reaction from you when I showed you the picture of the girl whose cheek was infected with fly larvae than when you saw the map with the red dots. We as human beings have an emotional reaction to other people as people, as persons. And when we can take pictures of things and call people by name and tell their stories, that drives much more of a willingness to be compassionate and rescue. In fact, there's a word called the rule of rescue. And in economics, we've realized that saving an identified life with a name and a photograph is worth more money and more of our attention than saving another person who is just as real but who can't be photographed and only can be imputed statistically. Both deaths are deaths, both lives are lives, but our compassion does not treat those same things equally. So let's talk about the multiple perspectives that will come to bear in this space where health has these three major components that are motivating us to intervene uh, using government instruments. When the government intervenes and when we agree to make policy, we may have objectives about health insurance. And as I said at the beginning of the lecture, and as I'll say throughout the course, economists define health insurance as having a main objective to protect against the unpredictability of health care expenses. Other people see health insurance in other ways. When we talk about what we want out of health care, some say that the biggest goal is to deliver cost-worthy or efficient health care. Some say the biggest goal is to make sure that health care is equally and equitably distributed to society and that it's distributed fairly. Others say that what we want most from health care is to make the services more respectful and kind and friendly, etc. When we talk about objectives for health, there's a special concern for the health of disadvantaged groups. There might be a special concern for the health of workers who are produ producing 
goods for the society. And there can be special objectives about financing public goods that affect health versus private goods that we can individually purchase. Finally, unrelated to health, there might be a general social objective to redistribute income between the rich and the poor, between the healthy and the sick, between powerful and the weak. This redistributive objective can be mixed in with objectives about health care. So let's move on to the study of systems and talk about how one defines a health system. In classical economics during Smith and Ricardo and Marx over 150 years ago, they asked the question, how does our whole economic system work? However, in the last part of the 21st century, neoclassical economists began to undertake comparative studies during the Cold War, and they were really fighting a battle between Marxist systems and capitalist systems, trying to find out why these systems differed. And of course, from the U.S. side, the Cold Warrior economist was trying to make the case that the capitalist system was better and more productive and worthy to convince others throughout the world to side with the Western bloc against the, the communist bloc. However, this era of studying health systems is going to be useful for a course in health economics. And before we launch into the principles of economics, I'd like to begin making some basic definitions about what we mean when we talk about health systems. We're going to start with the basic elements in a health system. And we only need to know about three different basic elements. Systems have economic agents. An agent is an individual with a specific role in the system. A patient is an economic agent. A nurse is an economic agent. The manager of a, of a hospital is an economic agent. They have a specific role in the system. A unit or an economic unit is a group of individuals who are brought together for a common purpose. For example, the individuals that work in a hospital could be called an economic unit. Or the provider groups who are brought together in a physician practice might be an economic unit. These agents and units operate under institutions. This word institutions means norms, rules of conduct, established procedures. For instance, the idea that we should have private property, the idea that there should be corporations, the idea that when a fine is incurred, it should be paid, the idea that if you have enjoyed a meal at a restaurant, you should tip your waiter. That is a norm or a rule of conduct. So be very careful. This word institution in our course is going to mean a norm or a rule of conduct. There is another usage of this English word that is used to mean a place or a building or a group. That is not what we mean by institution. Forget that use of the word and focus when we say the word institution on the rules and the norms. I often ask students to look at the, the middle of the word institution. And if you look right here, S-T-I-T -T is very much like the word statute. In fact, it is coming from that same root statute. So institutions are the collections of statutes that we use to drive our health economy. Let's take a sports analogy. Here are the Pittsburgh Steelers. I've pointed out one agent named Ben Roethlisberger. He's the quarterback. There is the unit of the team called the Pittsburgh Steelers, and they are running around on a green field under a set of rules and norms that everybody understands. And in black and white in the middle of the photo is an institutional enforcer known as the referee that makes sure that the rules are followed. And they all expect that referee to do what he's doing here in the middle of the field, which is to, to break up a fight. The fight is a violation of the rules. So now that we have the building blocks, we can define an economic system as a collection of economic units, agents, and institutions that interact coherently, adapting and adjusting to the social and physical environment. So in just a minute, I'll define those three underlined words, coherence, adaptation, and adjustment. And so it's simple to extend that definition to define a health system as an economic system that is concerned with human health. So now we know that there are units and agents and institutions. We must now define these three highlights of what makes it a system. There has to be coherence, adaptation, and adjustment. What are those things? So first, 
Adjustment is transforming and redistributing resources to improve function, exploit opportunities, and resolve weaknesses. Adjustment is changing how you play under the rules. It's the Pittsburgh Steelers choosing to pass the ball rather than to t play a ground game. It's the health insurance company choosing to raise premiums rather than to lower costs. Staying with the same rules, but playing smarter play. The second option is to adapt, which is much more rare. It is to get agreement about brand new institutions, brand new rules or norms that can be used on the playing field. Finally, coherence is the degree to which the agents and the units coordinate their activity for a common purpose. So those are the three highlights that are going to tell us when a health system is a health system. If there isn't any adjustment, adaptation, or coherence, it's not a health system. And if it doesn't focus on health, it's not a health system. When we look at health systems, we can outline the various economic units that participate, and we can mark out household as a very important unit that is important to produce health. There is the primary health service delivery subsystem, which are units devoted to making sure we can see the doctor and get drugs and taken care of when we're sick. There's the financial protection system that pays the bills for primary health care. There's a quality assurance system that supplies the quality and makes sure that when the doctor sees you or when the drugs are purchased, they are of high quality. There is a system for moving the drugs and supplies around the world. And there is a system for making innovation in healthcare. So let's give a quick quiz. Which of the following are health systems? The neighborhoods in West Baltimore, the Association of American Medical Colleges, Black and Decker Incorporated, or medical malpractice courts? Think about this for a minute. The correct answers here are that the Association of American Medical Colleges and medical malpractice courts are health systems. One would say that when the colleges have grouped together, they are hopefully trying to participate in producing a supply of doctors. And the medical malpractice courts are used to help produce the quality of medical care. Black & Decker is a company that isn't focused on making health, it's trying to make power tools. The neighborhoods in West Baltimore actually don't do much to try to create health for their residents. So let's try to understand systems. And let's use an analogy that economic systems are to society what organ systems are to the body. There are multiple systems, not one system, and dysfunction in one affects others. If we ask, what do systems do? They adapt and adjust coherently. How do we as economists or scientists study systems? We really are focused on asking, what are the institutions? What are the norms? We look at the adaptations and the adjustments and try to see how these policies change. There is no best system, but there is well understood and poorly understood systems. Here in America today, we are undergoing a major adaptation as the Affordable Care Act rolls into its third year of full implementation. This was a major adaptation of the U.S. health systems and the adjustments going on all around the system as corporations and politicians begin to try to figure out how to play with this system and adapt it in the future uh, are all running through. So let's give more examples of institutions. Households have rules and norms of folk remedies where they will perhaps give honey and lemon tea when someone gets a cold or they'll uh, buckle up their overcoat when the wind is blowing. Many beliefs and un unwritten rules about how to stay healthy exist in our households. In the primary health service delivery system, the idea that there should be a place called the clinic is an institution. The clinic itself with the bricks and the mortar and the glass windows, that is also the old-fashioned meaning of institution. I want you to think of clinic as the idea that there should be places, not as the place, like the, the Mayo Clinic is, is one example of an economic unit. The financial protection system uses as a major institution the idea that there can be an insurance contract. And we'll spend a lot of time describing what an insurance contract is. The quality assurance system uses 
an institution called licensing. The idea that one has to prove their competence by taking exams and passing through requirements in order to get a piece of paper called a medical license or a nursing license. There are many ways to move drugs and supplies around the earth. One way is called a market. This is an institution. It's one way to move them. There are other systems that do not use markets where a boss in an office describes where the drugs should move and commands them to move through space. There is also an innovation system and one way to provide innovation is to offer patents and licensing, but there are other ways to innovate. This isn't the only way. I'm just here to say that these are examples. They are not the only example of how these particular systems develop their own institutions. Inside those institutions, there are adjustments. There are ways to play differently under the rules and norms. For instance, if one has an institution of folk remedies, there can be special feedings, foods that you eat when you're feeling sick. In many places, when your tummy hurts, they will give you chamomile tea as an example of a folk remedy. That is an adjustment, how you play the game under the rules of folk remedies. If one is operating a clinic, one might adjust the behavior of the clinic to have an outreach campaign and send home nurses out to a school or to a workplace. An insurance institution might change how it plays its co-payment rates. It might lower how much patients have to pay when they are paying for health care. A licensing system might offer new exams, and this would be an adjustment to the current system. Markets might make a drug over the counter rather than by prescription, and this would also alter its distribution through space. And patent systems can change the patent lifetime so that patents last for more years. These would be major adjustments. Adaptations, as I said, are rare. They are big alterations of the rules and the norms. So decentralizing the governance of a health system, instead of having the state government write the rules that govern the health system, one could devolve that down to cities or counties. That would be a major change. One might change who offers health insurance and move it from private companies to the government. That would be a major adaptation. In the U.S., we call that the policy of single payer or an expansion of Medicare or Medicaid would be an example of that adaptation. In China, there was an adaptation in which they deployed an army of barefoot doctors as community health workers to go door to door to promote healthier ideas. Let me give examples of coherence. When we talk about achieving coherence, human beings have often used tradition. The one generation communicating successful strategies to the next generation and the new generation listening and respecting that tradition is a way to achieve coherence. In economics, there are market signals that can be used to get coherence and we talk a lot about price as a signal of quality and demand and value in the market and many suppliers and demanders use price as a way to become coherent. But market signals are not the only way to achieve coherence, and under other regimes, there can be a command and control coherence, where everybody has to work for a boss, and the boss tells people what to do and says, I will fire you if you don't do what I say. So individuals have to be motivated in order to get this coherence to occur. We have to be motivated to believe in tradition. We have to be motivated to respond to market signals or to what our boss tells us to do. There can be mater material incentives, moral incentives, or coercion that would get us to cohere to these coordinating signals. Power comes in because power is relative to the motivations that operate in a system. Many people accumulate power by controlling money and titles and space in an office and assets and status, and they deploy that control to make individuals motivated to become more, more coherent in the system. So this is the power of coercion to use that money and assets in order to make people do what, what is necessary for the coherence of the system. A third form of power is to control information. We as individuals 
can become more, more coherent if we understand what the other units in the organization are trying to do. And opening up information is often used to create coherence, but some organizations choose to keep information very tightly held and narrow as a way to deploy power and achieve coherence. So this is just a summary of what we're going to cover in our course on health economics. What we've done so far today is distinguish health versus health care versus health insurance. And in our course, we'll learn that each of these is not like ordinary commodities that might be studied in economics. Ordinary economics are things like apples or shoes or cookies, in which case everybody kind of knows what a cookie or a shoe or an apple is. In health, because of uncertainty and asymmetric knowledge and externalities, we will see a lot of government intervention in order to achieve multiple objectives. And we will see that government intervening in a complex system in which there are units and agents and institutions all trying to achieve coherence. So that's the background, and it's important to get that background before we go deeper into the field of health economics. Thank you for listening.